Good morning. All right, so we are in a study of the book of John, and we are looking at who Jesus is. What does he say about himself? What do others say about him? And can the claims that Jesus makes about himself be verified? Are they true? And if they're true, how does that impact how I live? How does that change who I am? Jesus has claimed several times to be the I am. God, divine. And in doing so, we ask the question, how does him being the I am change who I am? Now, I've stressed through this series the importance of looking at the historical background. So I want to take a few moments this morning to give you some background information that would have been common knowledge to any Jew of Jesus' day about shepherding and about sheep. Now, shepherding is not a luxurious lifestyle. There's not much glory in being a shepherd, but it was much needed. And no Jew would have argued with the fact that sheep were a very valuable resource. And whether you actually went out and shepherd, she were the shepherd, you may have owned sheep. And that would have been a valuable resource to you. The shepherd lived with the sheep out in the field. And he would take the sheep from green pasture to green pasture. He would take the sheep far and wide throughout Israel looking for those green pastures to tend the flock. And at night, they'd go into shelters, pens, that would be used by multiple uh, flocks or multiple um, folds. And that would be where the sheep were kept at night to be kept safe. And the shepherd would watch as the sheep came in, and he would make sure, are all of them here? Were, were any of them wounded? Do, do any of them need to be attended to? The shepherd put a lot of care into his sheep because one sheep lost was a great price to be paid. It was a great loss of, of inventory. Sheep were not so much used for their meat in Jesus' day as much as for the wool and for the milk. Now, when we think of green pastures, when we think of the, sheep, the shepherd leading his sheep out to green pastures, this is normally what we think of. We think of lush green fields. But this isn't Israel. This doesn't exist in Israel. This does. See, the land of Israel is a land flowing with milk and honey. And though that refers to the, the, um, the plenty of the land, it's referring to two parts of the land. There is the land of milk, the desert, where the shepherd lives. And then there's the land of honey, where the farmer lives, where he tends the crops. And no shepherd would take his sheep to the fields lest the sheep be stoned for damaging the valuable crop. The only time that the shepherd would make his way to the fertile farm ground is at the end of the harvest, about this time of year, a couple weeks late after the harvest so that any of the poor could come and glean the edges of the field. And then the sheep were allowed to come in and graze whatever was left. That was the only time that the sheep would have that kind of plenty. So the shepherd cared for deeply his sheep. And the amount of care that the shepherd put into his flock dictated how well the sheep did. One of the things that I'd mentioned earlier is the fact that there were these enclosures mostly made of rock, probably occasionally made of wood, sometimes a cave. It'd have one entrance. And there would be one shepherd that would normally sit across the entryway. He would act as the gate, keeping anything of danger out and keeping the sheep in. And a thief would have to climb over the wall in order to get to the sheep. Normally, probably having to kill the sheep to keep the sheep quiet so that the shepherd was not alerted. So a thief came and had no intent of caring for or looking after the flock. He only had evil intent if he was going to steal. We have been looking over the past couple weeks at the Feast of Booths. And one of the reasons for that is because it just took place this last week. It ended this last Wednesday. And it was during this feast that Jesus made several claims about himself. 
Jesus claimed during this feast to be the living water. He said, any of you who are thirsty, come to me and drink. If you're looking for salvation, don't look to the skies for rain. Look to me. And then Jesus stood up at the end of the feast. It would have been this last Thursday or maybe a little bit later towards evening. So it would have technically been like Friday for them. And he stood up and said, you're looking for light? I'm the light of the world. Come to me and have somebody guide you in how you ought to live. And the discussion that then took place and the debate that took place, Jesus then claimed to be the great I am. Before Abraham was, I am. I existed. I'm the existing one, the eternally existing one. So Jesus has claimed over and over again out of this feast. Now Jesus then proved his statements to be true in healing the man born blind taking passion and pity upon this man. And that's what we looked at last week, was the fact that Jesus stepped into this man's life and changed it radically. And it's out of this context that we find our passage today. I'm going to start our reading in 9, and then we're going to get into 10 of John. John chapter 9, John chapter 9 starting in verse 40. Those of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and said to him, we are not blind too, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have need of, you would have no sin. But since you say, We see, your sin remains. Chapter 10, verse 1. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door of the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens. And the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own by name, and he leads them out. And he pull, puts, sorry, when he has put forth his own, he goes ahead of them, and the, shepherd, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow, but they will flee because they do not know the voice of the stranger. Jesus refers to something that every Israelite would have understood, that of the practice of shepherding, how sheep are tended. These leaders of Israel are claiming to know and understand and see. So Jesus puts that to the test. He says, all right, you understand about shepherding, right? And they go, huh? He's like the, the practice of shepherding. And they're sitting there confused. Now, I know that Jesus had to have in mind a passage like Jeremiah. Jeremiah 23, starting in verse 1, says this. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering my sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord God of Israel says concerning the shepherds who are tending my people. You have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not attended to them. Behold, I am about to attend to you for the evil deeds that you have done, declares the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of the flock out of, my, out of all the countries where I have driven them. And bring them back to their pasture, and they will be fruitful and multiply. I will also raise up the shepherds, sh a shepherd over them that will tend them, and they will not be afraid any longer, nor will they be terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the day is coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up from David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king, and he will act wisely and do justice. In the land, it was a common understanding, and the prophets use this over and over again, of God being the shepherd and the leaders of Israel, especially the religious leaders, being like shepherds, tending the people, looking out for the people, caring for the people. So here is a blind man all of his life, he's existed in darkness. And when he finally receives his sight, Instead of rejoicing and praising God that one of their sheep is better off, they put him through the ringer, ask him a thousand questions, and then they throw him out of the assembly of God's people. And Jesus then comes to this man and takes pity on him and begins to talk to him. And the religious leaders then attack Jesus at that point. They say, we see. Why are you dealing with this man? He says, well, if you see so well, let me ask you, 
you shepherds of Israel. You understand shepherding. And I find it interesting that it's at this point in verse 6 that Jesus says he used this figure of speech to them, but they did not understand the things which he had been saying to them. It was completely lost on them. They completely missed it. So Jesus says it again. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me, they are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go out and come back in and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. So Jesus once again tells them, you you understand this concept of, of the pen and bringing the sheep in where they're safe, where they're cared for. I'm the door. I care for the sheep. I'm the door. Any danger that comes in has to go through me. I care deeply about my sheep. And you, the shepherds of Israel, have not. And example number one, wrong direction, would be the blind man. The man standing right in front front of them as they're having this conversation. You didn't care for him. Like was pointed out this morning in a really great Bible class in here. They didn't even know his name. They had to bring in his parents. Is this even the man? The shepherds didn't even know their sheep. Jesus continues. Start in verse 11. He says, I am the good shepherd. The sheep, the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is the hired hand is not a shepherd uh, and not the shepherd who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and he leaves. The shepherds, or leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them away and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me, even as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Like I said earlier, The sheep's well-being is dependent upon how good the shepherd is. If you have a good shepherd, the sheep are well taken care of. They have no worry. And that sheep will follow you anywhere you go. That sheep will have so much trust in a shepherd that he will walk right off a cliff because the shepherd is on the other side and he's going straight to the voice. But a bad shepherd will lead his sheep astray. He won't find the green pastures. He won't find that nourishment that is needed for that day. In the deserts where the shepherds would live, there's not enough nourishment except for that day. And that sheep had to have complete trust in his shepherd. He'd walk up a little bit further. He had a little tuft of grass. He walked to the shepherd's voice again. There was another tuft of grass. And all the sheep had to know was I have a shepherd and I have a tuft of grass. And that's enough. I have enough nourishment for today. And Jesus, looking at these religious leaders, says, at worst, you're a thief. You're a robber. You're the danger from which the people of Israel need to be saved. At best, you're a hired hand that cares nothing about the sheep. And instead of having a backbone and standing up to the leaders or the wolves, you flee. Because it's all about you. It's all about your own comfort. Over and over again in Scripture, this image of God being the shepherd is used. And this was talked about in class this morning as well. In Psalm 100, starting in verse 1, he says, Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord Himself is God. It is He who has made us, and we not ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him. Bless His name. For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. And His faithfulness to all generations. It was a joyous thing for the people of Israel to think of God as their shepherd. They rejoiced in it. 
It was wonderful to have God as their shepherd, leading them, caring for them, taking care of them. We think of Psalm, one, uh, Psalm 25, 24, 23. Psalm 23. I'll get it eventually. Right? Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. We understand that imagery. We're familiar with it. And the Israelites would have been even more familiar with it. I think Jesus here is referring, though, to passages like Ezekiel. That says, Then I will set over them one of my shepherds, my servant David, and he will feed them. And he will feed them himself and be their shepherd. And, the, and I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David will be a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. So in passages like here in Ezekiel 34, we see that it was well prophesied that a shepherd was coming. A good shepherd was coming. That was going to throw out the religious leaders who were failing God's people. And he would then raise up a shepherd from David, the Messiah. And that that shepherd would care for deeply his sheep. Jesus says, I lay down my life for the sheep. That's how much I care for them. That's how much I care for them. I'm willing to die for them. In 1 Peter chapter 5. The Apostle Peter writes to the church and says, Therefore I I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ. So so Peter's writing to these elders and he says, I'm not going to talk to you as an apostle. I want to talk to you as a fellow elder. He says, As a witness of the suffering of Christ and a partaker also in the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntary according to the will of God and not for gain, not for gain, but with eagerness, nor as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but providing an example to the flock. And then when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive an unfading crown of glory. Here in this congregation, we are very blessed, in my opinion, to have great elders. In what little time I've been here, I have been so blessed by seeing the care for which the shepherds of this congregation look over you and care for your well-being. But there is a need still for other men to rise up and have that same concern to begin to care for and look after one another, to begin to be discipled by our elders. Because the eldership here understands the gravity of the requirement placed upon their shoulders. That they are seeking to be like Christ in every way possible. To the point of willing to lay down their life and suffer hardship in order to see the flock flourish. And it takes many hands. Many people concerned to do that. And for that to be effective. Jesus then says in John chapter, six, or chapter 10, verse 16, He says, I have sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. Jesus here makes the distinction between a flock and a fold. A flock is the whole of what is owned. The fold is the section that a particular shepherd can handle, right? If you're a very rich uh, sheep owner, you may own a thousand head of sheep. And there's no way that one shepherd can handle that many sheep. There's no way that that many sheep in one location can graze one hillside and have enough nourishment for the day. He'd walk all the others uh, to death just getting enough food for the ones in the back. Right? So the, the flock would be broken up. So Jesus says, I have a, another fold, another group of people that has to be brought in. They're all part of the same flock. And I will be their one shepherd. I will guide them. And obviously what he's talking about here is, is you're the Jews. I'm a shepherd of you, but I also am a shepherd of the Gentiles. And I have to bring them in, in also. And I will be one. And if you have... 
any uh, frustration or any, any uh, difficulty in understanding this relationship between the Jewish nation, nation and that history and Christianity and how the Gentiles and the Jews commingle under the new covenant. I encourage you to come back on Sunday night. We're looking through the book of Galatians and we're wrestling through some of these things. In John chapter 10, verse 17, Jesus continuing with his thought says this. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own indication. I have the authority to, take it, to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. This commandment I have received from my Father. So we have a flock, right? And we have a shepherd. And here comes a wolf, or a hyena, or maybe a pack. And the shepherd runs to the danger because he cares for the sheep. And he dies at the hand of the beast. In what way does that actually save the flock? Now you have a dead shepherd, no shepherd for the sheep, and predators. So the analogy almost breaks down. It's like, how does that work? So what Jesus is actually referring to here is the fact that he will put himself as ransom. Taking the place of the sheep. Instead of the sheep dying, I will die. And we see this take place very um, prolifically in the Old Testament to New Testament. In the Old Testament, one of the few areas where a sheep would die was when the shepherd would take it to the temple. And the sheep would be offered for his sins and the sins of the nation. And now Jesus says, as the shepherd, I'm going to go up to Jerusalem. And the sheep aren't going to be sacrificed. I am. I'm going to die. I'm going to take their place. I care for the sheep so much that I'll die. That I will take their place. So there's a role reversal that takes place here between the Old and New Testament. So how do we apply this? How do we take this and apply it to our lives? Well, will you trust Jesus? Will you let him be your shepherd? Will you follow him where he leads? Will you allow him to guide you, to mold you? Will you let him do that? And more importantly, do you? Do you follow Jesus wherever he leads you? He may not lead you to belly deep alfalfa, but he's going to lead you to a hillside of green pastures. And there'll be a tuft of grass here and a tuft of grass there. And down the road, there's going to be some still water where you can drink. And he'll take you in and he'll pin you up and he'll lay there in the doorway, keeping you safe. Will you trust him to be your shepherd? Will you trust him? I hope you will. I hope you will trust Him with everything that you are. With everything that you have. I hope that you will trust that He has your best interest at heart. Above anything else. So do you trust Him? I hope you do. However we can help you this morning. If you're ready to become part of the flock. To be baptized into Christ. To be clothed in Him. Or if you just need the prayers of the congregation for that encouragement to do what he's asked you to do. We invite you to come as we stand and sing.